Simon, lovely to meet you. And I just wanted to know, to start really from the beginning of your career and, and how acting came into your life. Oh God, how long have we got? Uh, <laughs> um, I suppose it was kind of a, a, an organic, a little bit of an organic process. I went to, I did sort of like amateur dramatic stuff that I try so hard to forget right now. Uh, and then went on to sort of do drama at school and then uh, and then went to drama school, uh, theatre and then film, you know, sort of. So it all kind of works uh, a kind of an organic way. I didn't, I don't think there was ever a moment where I thought, ah, oh, I'd love, I'm going to be an actor. It just kind of, I decided not to be a biologist, which is what I was studying <laughs> up until that point. So. And, and so who were your influences? Um, I don't know. Like I say, like really random thing. I don't ever think I, I looked to one person and thought, oh, I'd like to be that person. I think it was all like, I'd like to be in that film. You know, how you look at you watch Star Wars and you think, oh, I'd love to be Luke Skywalker, or I'd love to be rather than I, sort of, I fell in love with sort of characters rather than uh, the, film the film itself, all the actors playing it. Sort of. So you don't I didn't think about the process if you like like to be Indiana Jones, like to be James Bond or Luke Skywalker or something like that. And then you think, oh, okay, brilliant. How, I wonder how they do that. You know, sort of. And then. I suppose it goes from there. And, and, and you, you were you trained uh, as an actor. That's as well. right. Yeah. So uh, can you tell us wh where you trained and, wh and what was your choices really for, for choosing that college? Uh, yeah, well, I went to Guildhall, uh, which is in London. Um, and what was my choices? I what well, my choice at the time was I could have done I could have gone to Scotland to do marine biology, or I could have sort of stayed in London to do drama. And it was just you know I had to pretend to think about it for like ten seconds, but you know. <laughs> My, I think my father is still upset about it that I didn't choose the sort of doctor route. <laughs> sort of. He goes, oh, but you're good at science. I was like, oh, but it's really boring. He goes, oh, but you're good at it. I mean, you know, your, your parents have that old school sort of like, but if you're good at it, you should do it, you know. And know that very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're like, but I don't like doing it, you know. I like to do this. Exactly. And, and was, was it the, why, why, what was about the Guildhall as opposed to other maybe drama, the, the, maybe the drama centre or RADA that, that made you choose I just, that I went and I had an audition uh, for it and it was one of those things where, I, you know, it isn't a choice to go until you're given the choice to, uh, to go. So I went and I, uh, I can't remember, my, my first teacher was called Jan and I, he, he, rather than auditioning me, he just, get, just talked to me for an hour. Sort of, and I thought oh, I was all sort of geared up to read something, you know. Sort of, and he kind of just chatted with me for an hour, but whether I was on the right thing, and I just really responded to that. And you know what it's like—you're a good teacher. You think, yes, I'm going to go there. And after leaving sort of drama college, would you remember what your, your first acting role was? Yeah, I remember that drama college taught me nothing about working. Yeah, I, it was all wonderful, sort of Stanislavski yes. and all these sort of high theory sort of stuff, which is great. But uh, in the real world, you kind of scratch your head and you think, God, I, yeah, how do I get a job? Uh, you know, sort of. But I managed to get some work with a, a company uh, called Metro Theatre. Um, and then we went on to do some work with the RSC. It was all sort of Shakespeare theatre and we did tours and stuff like that. And then eventually I made a very clean leap from doing Shakespeare. I did about, oh, I did Shakespeare for about a year on tour. And then I made a, a Shakespeare film, like a modern adaptation of Measure for Measure. So, but I made that as a movie. So it was a very clean jump into film. So it was the smoothest <laughs> jump you could ever have uh, from my point of view. Was that a good grounding though, having the, the sort of the, that theatre to sort of yeah. to transfer your skills to, really. Absolutely. It was kind of like that, you know, it's the sort of paying your dues type thing, and you have to kind of do that sort of very long, you know, treks around Poland, we were doing sort of, uh, it sounded really glamorous, but it, it wasn't in reality, obviously, being stuck with a bunch of people sort of for like six months. But uh, yeah, no, it was worth doing, just to know that I would never want to do it again. <laughs> And when you when you start off, do you have to um, really take any role that presents itself to you and not be choosy, or you know how do you choose the roles you take? Uh, yeah, I suppose kind of. Yeah, you, you do sort of. Um, there's always a temptation to say no to something you don't like, but then you are the you have to be somebody else's whim sort of there. So yeah, no, I think you just gotta as long as you respond to what you're doing. If you hate it, obviously it'll probably show when you try to read it sort of so you don't usually get the parts you hate anyway sort of and the ones that won't work for you <laughs> it's, a, it's a connection again isn't it really which is everything about if you connect with the material it's sometimes well it's you're halfway home if you if you, if you like it and if you connect with it it's, it's just about them connecting with you then afterwards and how important is it for, for an actor starting out I mean I know I'm taking you back a long way here but uh, having a, a representative an agent or, or and how much do you have to really look for look for your own work 
Yeah, it, it, getting an agent is like I remember that when when I at the minute I left drama school, getting an agent was a priority, like as if the agents are the keys to getting more work, and they kind of are because they were they're aware of all the jobs coming up, and that's what it is. They don't really help you get the work, but they help you get the auditions, or, so that helps. Yeah, it's important. And you have to do it. Uh, sadly, <laughs> no, I like my agent. I shouldn't say that. It's great. She's lovely. No, no. <laughs> and what has been the highlight of your of your acting career to date? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's, there's moments in everything where it's highlight. Like, you know, sort of when we're doing uh, w one of the things, I did a comedy film with Richard E. Grant a while ago called How to Stop Being a Loser, and that was because he was such a, uh, you know, sort of brilliant actor, I, I, it was just great to do something with him. But then I, more recently I did uh, Airborne with Mark Hamill, who was Luke Skywalker. I've seen things in my life I don't fully understand. There's a universal truth that sometimes bad things happen to good people. I mean, I grew up with Luke Skywalker, so I was, you know, I'd be doing my scene with him and I'd be just, I'd all of a sudden just go into a stare and then they'd be like, Simon, it's your line. I'd be like, I'm so sorry, you're right, of course. I was just staring. Atlantic Flight 686 has taken off in the path of the worst storm I've ever seen. And all it takes for evil to win is for good people to do nothing. You produced that film as well, didn't That's you? That's right, with uh, Dominic, uh, who's the director. Uh, we did the uh, we did a comedy called uh, How to Stop Being a Loser together, so it kind of came out of that uh, sort of. So we carried that forward. But yeah, yeah, it was it was great fun to be able to tell a story. And when they were throwing around casting ideas, me and Dominic sort of with about the same ages, and we grew up Star Wars, and we just said, oh, you know, what about Mark Hamill? And they're like, you'll never do it. And you're like, of course you'll never do it. But let's ask, you know. And he did. <laughs> All of, the, of this industry really is about luck and, and putting yourself in the right place in the right time and, be, and yeah. being unafraid, isn't it, really, to just go for it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and in, in this instance, you know, what have you got to lose? The worst they can say is no, isn't it? Yeah, and that's it. I suppose you don't want to waste a lot of time thinking, chasing pipe dreams and that sort of thing. But, you know, we had that before. We said, you know, oh, oh well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Nobody can be insulted by being asked, you know, sort of. So, uh, and the same thing happened with Jean-Claude Van Damme when we asked him to do... Um, UFO, we thought, no, he's too big a name, you know, he won't do a small little British movie, but he did, you know, sort of, again, just because we were cheeky enough to ask, I think. And what's it like working with actors that have, you know, they've worked on these sort of big Hollywood films? I mean, I bear in mind that Mark Hamill, I think when Star Wars first started, yeah. that was an independent film anyway, wasn't it? Was it was, the first one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then obviously went on to, you know... I think it did quite well, didn't it? It did, yeah, yeah. So, so it was popular, and the merchandising was, didn't help. Yeah, they did, I think I've seen one or two things. One or two of those films, yeah, George Lucas seemed but, to do yeah. all right. <laughs> so when you're working with actors who have obviously worked on these sort of much, you know, much bigger budgets, what, what is that like? Uh, what's it like for them coming uh, to... Well, like for you having to kind of probably not pander to them, but it's obviously a much different environment to what they're used to working in. I think it's, um, you know, they always... Uh, um, the environment is one thing, but then the, uh, the material and the people involved make up more than half of it. So when they come into it, obviously their agents are like, right, well, he's got to have... A massive trailer and uh, his own chef and personal assistants and all that. And obviously, all those demands come through from you know the agent who's looking after them, make want to make sure they have it. But when you get to them and you tend to be able to just sit down with them and have a drink with them, they start to engage immediately with the material and immediately with the director and immediately with the other actors. And then you kind of realise that all those things kind of fall away a little bit if you get on with the person. You get on. And thankfully, Mark Hamill was just one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. Sort of. So uh, he was lovely. And his wife came with him, so she kind of looked after him anyway. Sort of. So. But isn't that nice for you as well, just as a person that these people that you've grown up watching and admiring yeah. have um, don't disappoint yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah because it's a huge letdown because we're talking oh, 30 is. years of letdown otherwise no, it isn't is, it? It is, it, it, that's terrible and it's the one fear people say don't meet your heroes and I, thankfully I've not been burnt by that yet sort of so uh, no no and Mark Hamill was the absolute pinnacle of that he was just absolutely humble and everything yeah the first time I saw Mark we were in the airport we went to meet him in the airport and he was sitting on the floor uh, not even on a chair he was just waiting to, sort of he just but he decided he wanted to sit down and he was just reading a magazine sitting on the floor and I was like looking around for him. <laughs> he just had a hat on and sitting on the floor reading a magazine. So it was a quite humble sort of me. I was like, hello. <laughs> it's a nice way to start though, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, it was great. And, and with regards to, as well to, to your producing, you, you've produced a lot of the material yeah. that, you've, that you've performed in. How yeah. important is it for you to do that and have creative control? It's, it's that creative control. So me and 
uh, Dom met a few years ago back, who's the director uh, of Airborne and Loser, and a few things I've done actually. Um, and we kind of, it was we were kind of both uh, young actors, and we were kind of thinking, well, how can we make stuff that we want to make? Uh, you know, sort of, it's all right doing other work for other people. That's part of the process, but wouldn't you much rather make a film that you wanted to make? You wanted, but you'd have so much more love for it. And we had both had a, a good degree of business acumen and knew how to put it together. And more, it was more about phone calls. We knew how to put together. And you know, Richard E. Grant and people like that, they're more likely to come and work for another actor. So when they know you're an actor, they say, oh, this is an actor, but he's trying to put his own project together. It's a comedy, it's low budget, you know, but will you do a couple of days on it? Sort of. And because the, the approach comes from an actor rather than a producer, it's a lot easier, sort of. Uh, I think, to get those people. Same yeah. with Mark Emmel, same with anybody. They, they just have that, again, it's that connection, isn't it? They resonate. Yeah. They, it resonates with them how hard it is to make film, so... Yeah, so they know. It, yeah, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and you, you've also moved on to directing. Yeah. Um, and what, what was it about this sort of part in your life that made you decide this was the right time? Um, when the story came to me, it was a, it's a film called Riots. It's about the 2011 London riots, um, sort of. And when the story came for me, the, the script was amazing. But no, I didn't connect with any of the characters. But I really wanted, the, I really wanted to see it made, sort of. So just as a producer in me, I thought this is a really good story. It deserves to be seen, you know. So I thought, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to direct it. And I'd seen, an, you know, enough and stopped, you know. And I just got the right support, sort of. I, I had a DOP I trusted, and uh, I had all the people around me that I trusted, sort of, not to let it up. But I just, it was there for the opportunity. It was there for the taking, really. The the writer wasn't keen on directing, sort of, so I, so I stepped in, sort of. Um, oh. So again, it was organic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and you, you said that you you connected to the material. I mean, we cover a lot of independent film um, with with the work we do, and sure. and the, a lot of them are based within the kind of urban East End um, theme, really. Uh, what is it about that? That those kind of films that that are so popular, really. I suppose it's characters, isn't it? It's just characters and story. And when they say write what you know, obviously, if you're in London and you're working in London, those characters, those stories are all around you. Um, I mean, the 2011 is a particular, the 2011 rights is a particularly frightening story because I think what was great, well, what was terrifying about it really was that nobody really knew why people were rioting. It was kind of one of those rebel without a clue things. But that was that social unrest that was really interesting. But the, the whole East End sort of genre thing, that's, um, I suppose that's accessible for low budget filming because you have this environment around you. Um, it's not, and we don't actually make too many of those. I was just thinking about airborne and uh, alien invasion films that we're doing, but this is the first one we've done that's kind of gritty and dark and stuff like that, sort of. Uh, so it, it was actually a new thing for us. Is that important for you as well to keep the creative juices flowing, yeah. g going through d different genres? We have a rule about doing about 70% of something we know and 30% challenging. Sort of. So 30% of stuff in any film should be brand new to us. Whether it's like we're going to have a massive CG scene in this or something that's very complicated, we'll try something at least new every once film and we'll switch genres all the time. And, and for your role as a, as a director, have you found um, um, a new kind of respect for the director and the kind of responsibilities he has within production? Yeah, definitely. But um, I, I found it easier to sort of communicate with actors because obviously, if you've been an actor and you're on the other side, you know the type of information you want. You don't want to be unloaded with things, you know, sort of, but um, you do want specifics and, you know, you want people to inspire you to do something rather than to tell you to do this or that, sort of. So that bit was certainly easier for me, yeah. And, and what are your aspirations for the future? Just to keep working. <laughs> I think as long as I can keep telling stories, uh, keep disappointing my dad about not being. <laughs> A marine biologist, uh, that will make me happy. That's, uh, that sustains me. <laughs> you know what you've got to do? You've got to play a part where you're a marine biologist. Well, there you go. That's it. Isn't it? And it's that's, sorted. Then that's everybody's the whole fulfilled. Problem thing. <laughs> Look at us. We've just sorted the whole thing out. Exactly. Just sitting here. <laughs> thank you very much, Simon. My dad says thank you. <laughs>